Hi, welcome to <clears throat> the first session on the second topic of the semester um, titled European Discovery, Conquest, and Colonization of America. So today we're actually initiating a new topic. This is the second topic of the semester, and this is the first session uh, that we're initiating. And the way we're going to proceed, it will be more or less uh, identical to how we did in the first topic in that there will be approximately three sessions uh, offered on this topic um, again and each session is going to cover um, in, in the ideal world each one of those aspects I've just mentioned in this case let me put the screen so in the ideal world uh, today we will cover the uh, the aspect of discovery um, and then in the second session we proceed to look at uh, the conquest give and take I mean this is going to be the organization uh, of how we're gonna actually divide the sessions and of course uh, the last session will look at the early colonization of America so again it's just looking at early stages of colonization so we're not really uh, be going, you know, to look at the entire <clears throat> colonial period is just again uh, how the first series of colonies were established uh, during the 1500s and early 1600s, and we're going to stop there, of course, because um, we're going to actually in the third topic look at uh, religion uh, as another factor for uh, early colonization as well, which is going to be completely a, again, a separate topic that will focus exclusively on religion as the force, as the main historical force for uh, Europeans uh, arriving to the New World, to uh, America, to establish settlements and colonies. But in this topic, uh, we're going to be really focusing on economics primarily uh, in order to understand uh, the process by which the Europeans initiated uh, the age of discovery. Uh, economics, of course, was a, one of the main forces behind the age of discovery. Uh, and, of course, the conquest as well. Uh, we're going to explain, you know, exactly uh, what were the uh, motives or the factors that led the Spanish conquistadors to, again, come to the New World and, of course, uh, engage in the process of the conquest, of course, and then the colonization, uh, early colonization stages as well, uh, are going to be analyzed in that fashion. Again, we're looking at <clears throat> economic matters or economic forces that came into play uh, for the Europeans to look at America again as <clears throat> a new commercial opportunity. We're going to actually look at that again. Uh, so it's, this is going to be a, an economic um, interpretation of history, so an economic analysis of history, so is going to be looking at primarily again uh, economics. Uh, not that we're going to ignore other uh, aspects as well, but it's going to be very much centered on that issue. Um, so we're going to actually start our topic with. Um, a general overview of European civilization uh, because before we actually look at the age of discovery that initiates roughly around the 1200s, 1300s AD, uh, before we get to that point it is important to look at the background of Europe and just looking back very briefly again this is just a general uh, uh, overview of European history, uh, which will enable us to understand, you know, how Europe was like in very general terms. Once again, so we're not going to spend a lot of time talking about Europe here, but at least to gain general knowledge about how the continent of Europe was like before the age of discovery, how Europeans lived, how they carried their economic activities, for example and how that way of life and that economic form of organization is going to change 
with the age of discovery so it's important just to see the world before and then how the world in Europe is going to start changing around the 12 and 1300s when the age of discovery begins and we're going to look at the changes as well in other words what kind of changes transpired in Europe with the age of discovery <clears throat> all right so so we begin then with um, let me just increase here okay so we, we begin here with first understanding um, the rise of European civilization when so when we talk about Europe uh, particularly European civilization uh, we have to look back to the ancient Greeks because the ancient Greeks uh, really were the founders the mother uh, culture if you will of European civilization again so when we talk about European civilization it goes back to the ancient Greeks uh, the ancient Greeks created their cities uh, a series of city-states again so <clears throat> uh, the cities back in the ancient world was like a nation okay for us you know in the in today's world in the, the modern world the modern nation state in other words you know back in this time people did not live in nations per se uh, people had not yet you know uh, developed large uh, urban centers in which uniting the, those centers they create something called a nation uh, the city was their nation so if you were born in a city uh, or you migrated there uh, this is this is your country in other words okay so <clears throat> we're gonna see that the Greeks pioneered the city-states uh, in other words that before 800 BC this is more or less when we see the rise of the city-states in ancient Greece uh, the ancient uh, the peoples of Europe still lived uh, in small communities and small villages in other words and the villagers um, they farm the land they grow you know some some crops like wheat for example um, and they live in very small nested communities but there's gonna be a transition uh, in Europe around 800 BC so 800 uh, or eight centuries before uh, the common era or we call the Christian era uh, we're going to see that in this part of Europe, it's called Eastern Europe, uh, there will be now a growing group of people. Again, <clears throat> today we simply know them as, in, in generic terms, as the Greeks, um, and they're going to start building cities. And I mean, those were advanced again uh, centers of uh, learning that had uh, actually schools. Uh, that will train people since very early age all the way to adulthood in the sciences in the arts for example uh, physical education and so on and so forth <clears throat> and they're the pioneers of course of what today we call the universities I and mean, this idea that you can actually school people you can actually transform them intellectually speaking and uh, enable them how to actually develop their intellectual faculty so they can actually analyze the world around them acquire knowledge etc so they can reason uh, you know and explain how things work etc so we got of course writing systems on the rise during those times we got philosophers who were the instructors they were the teachers <coughs> of those uh, populations in those cities and they're going to be training of course the future generations uh, so they can continue the project of course of carrying on the knowledge of their forefathers forward again in the future uh, so they're gonna be the pioneers of modern-day universities so to speak you know centers of learning and people can just go there for a number of years and of course become extremely educated um, so they can go back to the city and serve the community in many in many ways in the administration for example and, you know, and the state the 
the city state, of course, carrying out administrative functions and so on and so forth of various kinds or carrying out things like warfare or, you know, conducting scientific endeavors or pursuits and so on and so forth. So this is the contribution of the ancient Greeks. They created that. They pioneered uh, the concept of the university uh, because anywhere in the world, when you look at all over the world, uh, around this time, you know, there are no universities anywhere. And even today, <clears throat> modern day universities take uh, the model of the university from the ancient Greeks. I mean, we kind of inherited uh, this particular um, development. Um, so from them, again, so we're trying to, in, in a certain sense, emulate, you know, the ancient Greeks in, in, in that we, we believe that education is a force for transforming people and turning people uh, into truly wise, enlightened beings, if you will, if you, they, you know, go through a program of education and so forth, so forth for a number of years. Another, again, another contribution of the ancient Greeks is the idea of democracy. Um, those city-states, particularly the city of Athens, uh, was well known um, during those times to have developed a system of government in which the people, the city dwellers, the citizens, um, will be taken into account whenever certain actions needed to be taken, certain laws needed to be formulated, you know, regarding taxes, for example, and so on and so forth. And so uh, the idea was that every citizen had a duty, a civic duty, a civic responsibility to make the city function and citizens count it, in other words. Uh, it was necessary for them to participate in the construction of the city, in sustaining the city, in every possible way, and one was, of course, taking you know, uh, you know, into account uh, their decisions. Now, of course, uh, it was known back then that the people that could vote were people that has a significant influence, of course, in the society. You know, like merchants, uh, landowners, you know, administrators, and so on and so forth. Again, so uh, what will happen is that people will rush. Uh, to the main square of the city uh, when they were called upon, whenever a new law needed to be enacted, and of course by ra either raising their hand or um, actually using certain stones or rocks and putting them on certain baskets. Uh, it's like a vote. They're casting a ballot, if you will. And, you know, the basket that says yes and the basket that says no will be counted at the end and again it was the majority majority rule so that's what democracy means is rule by the people and rule by the majority again it's majority rule <clears throat> so again they kind of experimented you know uh, with democracy for a while it didn't really last very long this experiment because uh, by 250 bc uh, democracy is now going to be replaced by monarchy. Presumably, uh, the Greeks lived under certain uh, monarchical stage, uh, monarchical states. I'm sorry. Uh, prior to this experiment of democracy, presumably, again, there were little small kingdoms, etc., scattered around this area. But as the city-states began to flourish, uh, the ancient Greeks began to pretty much experiment with this idea of democracy, only to revert uh, once again to monarchy uh, towards 250 BC. By 250 BC, we're going to see uh, the collapse of many of those city-states because we're going to see the emergence of kingdoms and, and empires in that region and warfare. And around this time, Greek civilization is also winding down. So it's really facing you know, uh, off again from the scene gradually, slowly, but surely. So this is a civilization that lasted roughly about five centuries uh, or so. But what's significant is that the ancient Greeks pretty much 
began the process of constructing or building cities, systems of government with trained administrators. They trained sectors of the population in those universities. They created arts and sciences, writing systems, and so on and so forth. And this is going to, to become a sort of blueprint for the rise of other civilizations in Europe. Uh, there will be, uh, of course, another civilization that is going to flourish. Again, so this is the region of ancient Greece here in southeastern Europe. Just going back again, this is pretty much where the ancient Greeks uh, build their cities <clears throat> in the ancient world. Uh, but after the fall of the uh, ancient uh, Greek city-states, city uh, we're going to see in another part of Europe another civilization that is flourishing that, as far as we know, um, this civilization inherited uh, a lot of the knowledge, a lot of the sciences and the mathematics, uh, the philosophy, uh, even, again, the religion of the ancient Greeks, the mythology, and he's going to reformulate it in a different part of Europe, more to the west of Europe. Uh, and this is a civilization that we know as the Roman civilization. Okay, the, the Roman civilization. So after the Greeks came the Romans... And once again, this is in Western Europe and around 200 BC, 200 years before Christ or the Common Era, we're going to see the flourishing of the first Roman settlements, Roman, uh, the construction of the very first cities. Um, and they're going to also... Uh, build systems of government that were not necessarily identical to the Greek in terms of that they were democratic, but that they were republican. Okay, They're going to call their system of government uh, republicans. Again, they were republican cities. And the difference between democracy and a republic is that in a republic, uh, the ancient Greeks were actually governed by, of course, a senate. And the Senate was composed of all of the landowners, the major uh, landowners of those cities. So the landowners were pretty much the ones that were, you know, administrating uh, the cities, making laws, writing the laws, etc., enacting taxes, and so on and so forth. Uh, it was pretty much a landowner loaning, landowning state, if you will. <clears throat> so around 67 years before the birth of Christ, around those times, uh, the, the Romans are in the process of now ending the Republican experiment and, of course, initiating something quite new, and, of course, that is the Roman Empire. Okay, So we're going to see the unification of the different cities uh, around Rome, which was the original, of course, city, the city of Rome, and the city of Rome itself is going to start expanding and absorbing all of those minor settlements and cities around it, and they're going to now uh, transform it into an empire, and of course, they're going to be ruled by an emperor from this point onwards, and there's going to be now, from this point onwards, a process of massive expansion. Um, the Roman Empire is on the rise, and this is an empire that will last roughly uh, until 450 uh, AD, 450 uh, after death or after Christ, that is to say, roughly speaking, around those times, uh, the Roman Empire collapsed. But during those 600 years or so of this Roman uh, experiment, whether it's, you know, from starting with the Roman city and the Republican system of government and then the imperial system that arises 
around 67 BC forward, uh, the Romans, of course, were also well known for uh, constructing, for building a number of cities across the regions that they actually uh, conquered, the regions that they absorbed, all of those territories, pretty much bringing Roman civilization along with the expansion. In other words, as they expanded, they were pretty much uh, civilizing, so to speak, or transforming, again, the provinces, the peoples that they encounter into uh, into Romans, if you will, or trying to influence their culture in that they will adapt a lot of elements of Roman culture in this case. So again, we're going to see the birth and the rise of uh, cities, cities that were each governed by laws, of course, <clears throat> laws that were crafted by the Romans in the city of Rome. And this is the, 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 the capital of the Roman Empire, that is to say. So they had very well established laws that the citizens had to abide by. Again, they were also... Uh, very, very successful arch um, architects in that they build a series of roads that connected uh, most of those towns and cities across the empire. And it was important because you needed to unify the empire, keep it together, that is to say, so the roads serve that purpose. You kind of tie communities together uh, if you build transportation networks uh, in order to actually carry out commercial activities, trade, and the payment of tribute. You know, every city had to pay tribute to Rome uh, every year, of course, and that was one way that they unified the empire through the construction of roads, canals for irrigation. They have massive agricultural projects uh, that were fostered through the development of canals, of course. And, of course, they also had sports, public sports events <clears throat> in which people attended every weekend, you know, uh, to watch gladiators, of course, fight <clears throat> the preferred sport of the ancient Romans. And, of course, this, this stadium that they built it was a series of stadiums, by the way, uh, that they built across, uh, across Rome, uh, across the Roman Empire, uh, where the Colosseums, again, this is the place where people every weekend attended to watch those, those, those fights, if you will. So, again, this is a gigantic uh, empire territorially, geographically speaking, again, that stretched east and west of Rome in the Italian peninsula, Okay. Uh, west as far as present-day Spain and Portugal, north as far as France and England, today we call it U the UK, um, and east as far as, of course, the eastern portion of Europe and into the Middle East, by the way, parts of the Middle East. Uh, present-day Palestine, for example, you know, became part of the Roman Empire. And to the south, there were parts of North Africa that were also uh, claimed and governed by the Romans as well. So this was a gigantic uh, imperial system that lasted, roughly speaking, around 450 uh, A.D. So after 450 A.D., uh, the Ro Roman Empire collapses, it was no more, and of course, <clears throat> with that, it, there's going to come, of course, a new phase, a new historical phase of Europe, uh, otherwise known as uh, the Middle Ages. Again, it was roughly speaking at the end of the Roman Empire, 450 when we look at European history from that, po that point onwards, again, this is a period of time uh, that will be known as the Middle Ages. Other, of, there's also other terms historians use, like the Dark Ages as well, because there was no scientific development, no technological development that we can speak of during this time. Um, and this is an age that is going to last until... 1200 or so of the contemporary era. Again, roughly speaking, from the end of the Roman Empire to 1200 uh, AD, 
from 450 to 1200 AD again this is again the 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 age in Europe known as the Middle Ages uh, medieval times or the medieval centuries of Europe um, now it's important to just look at this very briefly those Middle Ages because uh, for those centuries you know, we're looking about uh, roughly speaking about six to eight centuries again <clears throat> the Europeans entered into an era in which there was rel relative um, uh, stability. Again, this is not to say <laughs> that Europe was stable by any means, of course. Uh, life was threatened in so many ways, by the way. But in order to really provide some form of uh, order and security again uh, after the fall of the Roman Empire a new system came into being that governed Europe politically and economically until the 1200s and beyond but for those centuries again it was the predominant form of political and economic organization that uh, pretty much Europeans all across the continent lived under during those times uh, and this political and economic system I'm referring to that govern Europeans prior to the age of discovery uh, is known as feudalism again feudalism and feudalism comes into being precisely when the Roman Empire comes to an end around 450 and this economic system is going to continue governing Europe in different forms if you will different manifestations all the way to the 1500s AD more or less again this is roughly speaking uh, the best years of feudalism so to speak uh, because after the 1500s AD, uh, AD we're gonna see another economic system on the rise otherwise known as capitalism of course so let's look at feudalism because it's important to understand how Europeans lived before the age of discovery that started roughly speaking in the 1200s and how that life is beginning to change with the age of discovery and how we're gonna see the early stages the very early stages of capitalism arising with the age of discovery very early early stages by the way so, okay, so feudalism. Okay, so what is feudalism? So after the fall of the Roman Empire, what happened in Europe is that the stability, the security that the Roman administrators provided to the peoples of Rome, but also to all of the provinces that they governed across the Roman Empire that security that protection that is to say uh, was removed okay and it was removed because the Romans couldn't sustain the Empire it disintegrated and all of the Roman soldiers the Roman troops that were stationed in different parts of the Empire uh, had to retreat they had to be removed in many cases and of course that made Europe very vulnerable to a number of ratings of course and um, attacks by barbaric tribes you know, barbarians of course are beginning to take advantage that the the romans were not really guarding or securing securing the roads patrolling the cities patrolling the town the settlements of the empire so that really opened up of course europe for a number of different ratings if you will so there's a lot of insecurity people were getting robbed again on the roads there were a lot of pirates uh, stealing merchandise uh, in the cities people were constantly facing ratings you know from different barbaric tribes that they, they would just come and steal uh, animals or crops and so on and so forth so again life became quite unstable and insecure so what happens is that in that particular moment after the fall of the Roman Empire okay 
um, there were certain individuals, many of whom were actually connected to the Roman Empire of the past. Many of them were generals. Many of them were landowners of significant influence. Um, and they pretty much rose to prominence uh, in a lot of the towns and a lot of the cities ac across the former Roman Empire uh, because they offered protection. In other words, they were people who came forth and said, look, uh, we hereby you know, claim to uh, responsibility for the welfare, for the protection of the villages or the communities. So they became the Lord protectors, okay? The protectors of, of course, the populations. Um, and they came forth uh, uh, announcing this to people that uh, they will be responsible whenever there will be a raiding or there will be a barbaric tribe that menaced uh, a city or a town, they will be responsible to actually raise a small force, a small army, if you will, and they will lead that force to battle themselves in order to repel the invaders and make, again, the communities safe, if you will, okay? And the Lord protect us, in other words. So uh, this is going to give rise to a new system that is called feudalism, in which now the Europeans are accommodating to a new arrangement in that instead of living under Roman rule, protected by the Roman administrators and the Roman troops and the Roman soldiers, they're now going to be protected by the local leaders in the community. Again, many of them had military, military training prior, of course, to the fall of the Roman Empire. Many of them serve under the Roman uh, army, if you will. Uh, they own land. You know, they were prominent, of course, in the community. So now they're going to stay pretty much in the community uh, as the protectors. Uh, they're going to stay in that prominent position still. Uh, they're not going to be Romans anymore. They're not going to be serving a Roman imperial system, but they're going to become the strong man, like the father figure, if you will, of those communities. And there are going to be so many different Lord Protectors arising all over Europe. And again, this is going to give rise to the different kingdoms of Europe eventually. Uh, there will be over a hundred different small kingdoms propping up all over Europe. So instead of Europe being governed by a single imperial system, one empire, as the empire collapses, it's going to be broken up into many, it's going to be fragmented, if you will, into so many different petty kingdoms, if you will, in which the king, particularly of that particular kingdom, everywhere the kingdom arises, uh, is now the Lord Protector, if you will. Uh, of the population that lives within his or her realm, but more, more than likely, again, this is going to be a male-dominated, of course, uh, world in Europe for the most part. Um, so, again, over a hundred different kingdoms are going to arise all over Europe. And the king, of course, is going to also uh, create a class of landowners in order to for the landowners to help the king in times of warfare as well. This is going to be called the nobility, if you will, that there's going to be also certain landowners that are going to likewise, just like the king, offer their services to the king uh, to protect the kingdom as well. And they're going to be known as the patrons or patron, okay? Those are the Lord Protectors, whether we're talking about kings and a group of landowners. They're going to actually be the protectors of the communities, and the little settlements, all of which fall under the umbrella of a large uh, you know, political entity. We call that a kingdom, and it's going to be governed by a king, the strong man. He is the all supreme Lord Protector, if you will. And... The people that lived under the landlords, the Lord Protectors, uh, is the general population. Everybody else is just, again, the general population, whether we're talking about the peasantry, uh, farmers, 
uh, artisans, merchants, herders, and so on, they're going to pay for that protection. They're going to actually enter into an agreement, an arrangement, a contractual arrangement, if you will, that because they're being protected, they're being protected by the king and the other landowners, you know, the nobility, if you will, the knights, as they were called, uh, they have to pay for that protection, okay, for that security. And so, just like any client, okay, you pay for a service, uh, people will have to pay tribute to the feudal lord, to your landlord, to the king, if you will, because the times were changing in Europe, life was very uncertain, there was a lot of dangers and so on and so forth, so people needed to pay for that protection in the form of tributes. So feudalism, again, is going to be an economic system that divided people in Europe between patrons and clients. The patrons or the patrons, the strong men, again, are the protectors, uh, the kings, the knights, the landowners, and all of the people that were protected by them are going to be the clients, and the clients will have to actually pay for that protection, for that service that is being provided to them uh, in the form of tribute. In other words, a share of your whatever you're producing every year. If you're a farmer, if you're a peasant, uh, you know, there's a certain quota every year that a share of your harvest has to be paid uh, to the landowner, to the king, and so on for that protection. And if you're, you know, uh, an artisan, Okay, it's a small manufacturer, you know, this somebody that crafted actually clothing or tools in their own homes will have to also pay a quota again for that protection and so on and so forth. Merchants will have to pay it, so on and so forth. So again, it's a tribute system. This is really, a, really a, an economic system that divided people into two social classes, the feudal lords, and the commoners, and again, the commoners will simply go about their daily lives, carry out, carrying out their daily economic activities uh, with the only, again, requirement that they will have to actually pay tribute, like we, today we call that a tax, by the way, uh, to the landowner for protection, that is to say. So it, it kind of provided a sense of uh, security and stability in Europe, feudalism, that is to say, and that after the fall of the Roman Empire, we're going to see the emergence of the feudal states, the feudal lords, if you will, and um, over a hundred kingdoms are propping up pretty much everywhere around Europe, and this is how people live for over eight centuries, at least eight centuries. This is how people carry out their daily economic activities and there's only two social classes, by the way. Again, so the commoners I mentioned included pretty much all of the different groupings of society were peasants. 90% of the population were actually peasants, herders, herding animals, uh, uh, artisans, and the merchants. They were all considered to be commoners that uh, carried out their activities pretty much on their own and paid tribute. Now, what feudalism also entailed on an economic uh, level is that people produce only that which was needed to sustain themselves and their families, okay? So, what, what I mean about that is that what people did was simply trying to subsist from their work. This is self-subsistence economies. So people were growing their own food. Okay, 90% of the population were just working, people working the land, growing wheat, for example, and other vegetables and so on. And what they were trying to do simply was just trying to subsist from that work. I'm just growing the food that I need, me and my family, to subsist, that is to say. This is what I call work. Um, if I have a surplus, Okay, I'll probably trade or barter that surplus for 
other things that we need, maybe tools. I can go to the local market and actually trade a little bit of surplus grain that I have for, you know, things I need, for example, you know, and tools for farming and so on and so forth. Maybe some of the clothing that artisans crafted, you know, and then they go to the marketplace every week and there's trading, there's bartering taking place at the marketplace, etc. So this is a kind of very simple um, way of life in that uh, people are not really working to uh, produce excess or surplus products uh, to carry out, for example, commercial activities outside of the town. It was very rare. It did happen, but it was very, very small, the kind of outside trade that was taking place between the little kingdoms or the little cities within those kingdoms, by the way. There was no export-led production, that is to say. People did not really produce products for exports because, because you know, the, really the transportation systems were not developed b back then. So we're not really at this point talking about an international economy in which people were just simply trying to maximize production uh, from whatever work they were doing and because they were interested in shipping or exporting those products elsewhere. I mean, there was not, nothing like that. All economies, were, all economies were local or regional. In other words, you know, whatever you're producing, you're actually consuming or you're bartering or trading that and with maybe a couple of towns within the region and people are trading back and forth and very localized, very regional type of exchange, if you will. And even the political systems that function under feudalism during this time uh, did not grow very much uh, because those were agricultural states. And we talk about those monarchies, you know, there's, you know, uh, over a hundred, over a hundred different kingdoms that will prop up after the fall of the Roman Empire. Throughout this feudal age again most of those states were agricultural states in that the way that they function was by simply collecting tribute from the populations uh, in order to sustain the the class of lords and, you know the administrators the king members of the court and it was just tribute in the form of agricultural products so the revenues that the kings were actually collecting, again, the, from the tributes, was just, for the most part, the vast majority of them was just food products. Again, food products, grain, vegetables, you know, animals. You know, the herders will have to actually provide animals and so on uh, to, to those states. So during those times, those states couldn't grow very much. Okay, there was a limit to economic expansion or economic growth because a state cannot really grow by simply collecting foodstuffs from the population. Okay, there's a limitation to that. There's not a lot of money, in other words, coming in to the treasury because it's just tribute that you're just collecting and that's pretty much it to sustain, of course, the, the, the class, the feudal lords, the lord protectors, that is to say... So this is, again, how Europeans, in very general terms, lived prior to the age of discovery. How they were organized economically was very simple. It was just, again, lords and commoners, lords protected people, uh, and commoners paid tribute. And uh, the states did not really grow very much during those times because there was not a lot of source of revenue that they could tap into. Something that, of course, is going to change, as we'll see after the 12 and 1300s, as we'll see, because uh, with the rise of international trade, of course, many of those small kingdoms are beginning to expand and grow because they found an alternative source of revenue other than tribute to actually expand their economies and their wealth. And that was, of course, trade. So this is something that we're now moving into uh, as we initiate now part one, the age of discovery. So, so far, we just, again, discussed, um, we just discussed it in very, very general terms, the 
uh, the general overview of European civilization. All right, so let's move forward then with part one. And let's start the age of discovery. So it's imp it was important to know the world as it was prior to what is going to now take place after the 1200s, because now you'll understand the changes that are about to transform European civilization, how people lived, how people carried out economic activity, and the organization of the state is also going to change dramatically uh, with this new phase that is beginning. It's called the Age of Discovery. And as I mentioned in the beginning of, uh, session, of this session, session one, in that this topic is going to really provide an economic analysis of uh, the age of discovery, the conquest and colonization. So again, uh, the economy will be at the center of analysis here as we proceed. So therefore, please understand that as we're moving forward with the age of discovery, again, there's going to be a very significant focus on these economic forces, economic factors, really uh, altering the course of history, even initiating something like the Age of Discovery had to do 100% with uh, uh, economic, of course, factors uh, that were introduced um, in Europe and elsewhere, pretty much. And, you know, this is not only a European age, the Age of Discovery is a global age, by the way, that affected the entire globe. Uh, the age of discovery is not just that the Europeans are beginning to discover, you know, new lands or bodies of water, you know, oceans and so on, and new continents, but rather that the, the human population, uh, the entire cultures and all of the civilizations of the world are beginning to discover each other uh, in this process, in this new age. It's a global phenomenon. So like I said, the background to the age of discovery had to do with economics. And in this case, we're talking particularly about trade. This is the aspect of economics that really played a central role in the transformation of human cultures, human societies, and even the civilizations of the world beginning around the 12 and 1300s. It was long distance trade uh, how the world is beginning to become more and more interconnected through a systems of trading networks, long distance trade, and how the people are beginning to exchange commercial products across the world. Again, so long distance trade is the engine of history that is beginning to transform the world. And is really initiating what today we call the modern era. So even today, I mean, we live in the modern age, but if you really wanted to want to trace the early stages of the modern world, the early modern world, we're talking about the 12 and 1300s. This is the rise of the early modern world, if you will. Um, so long distance trade, is the engine of change and long distance trade by the 1400s and beyond uh, is going to mature all of the trading networks that were developed from the 13th to the 1400s together they're going to create an international economic system the first international economic system that was known back in those times as mercantilism. So we're going to see with the rise of long distance trade, the rise of an international economy, because prior to this time, there was not an international economy to speak of uh, in, in, in global history, in world history. So if you're in, you know, interested in economics or you're studying economics, uh, this is very important because this is really providing the historical background 
for the rise of an international economy. Again, uh, with mercantilism, this was the first e international economic system. Again, that provided pretty much the blueprint for the rise of an international economy later on. You know, there's going to be different systems, of course, uh, that came after mercantilism, like capitalism, for example. Okay, so mercantilism is very important because it really started binding the world together. And many regions and certain uh, parts of the world are going to become very interconnected commercially. And, and again, mercantilism pretty much provided what historians today call the first international economy. Okay, so how is it that we're going to see the rise of long-distance trade? What happened? during the 12th and 1300s that led to the rise of long-distance trade and mercantilism. Well, we can trace the rise of long-distance trade to a commercial revolution that got started in the 1300s of the contemporary era. A commercial revolution, a revolution of commerce in which merchants from Europe are beginning to build commercial links uh, with merchants outside of Europe, particularly merchants in the Middle East region, like around Egypt, and the, also in the Mediterranean Ocean as well. So we can see here, again in this map, again this is Italy, and of course, we're again talking about building networks with merchants in the Mediterranean Ocean, present-day Egypt, and of course, uh, the merchants of the Middle East also build networks or had been building networks with uh, also merchants uh, in uh, present-day uh, India and China as well. And we're going to see the exchange of goods, precious goods, luxury goods in many cases that are now flowing from one part of the world, let's say Asia, all the way to Europe. So the world was becoming more and more interconnected commercially. It was a commercial revolution that got started in the 1300s. And how this commercial revolution got started was due to the expedition of an Italian merchant by the name of Marco Polo. So Marco Polo is credited for being the forerunner, the pioneer of international trade. It's not that he actually knew that he was going to be, you know, altering the course of history with this expedition. Uh, he just stepped out of Italy, accompanying his uncle and father in a long journey to the Far East, to the Near and Far East. The Near East is what today we call the Middle East. And the Far East is what we today call India and China. So this expedition lasted for about 35 years, you know, from 1260 to 1295. It was a legendary, an epic journey, again, that lasted uh, over three decades, in that when Marco Polo accompanied his father and uncle, who were merchants, from uh, the city of Venice in Italy on this expedition. Uh, the or original intent is just like any other expedition is that we would just want to explore the world. They were explorers. They were uh, economic, of course, uh, type of explorers. They were not really scientific. Uh, the, the nature of the expedition was more economic in that what they wanted to do is just find out what other cultures, what other societies, what other civilizations produced that they could import in a future day and pretty much create a business venture, if you will, from that. In other words, we want to know, we want to have some form of index, we want to have some form of uh, database, so to speak, uh, of the kind of products that other cultures produce and find out which of those products particularly uh, can actually be imported in Europe. What kind of product would Europeans be interested in? In other words, 
of buying and consuming that we can actually import. So again, this is kind of like the beginning of the kind of export import type of activity. In other words, remember, I told you that under feudalism, uh, in the past, people were not really producing for exports. Okay, so it's just self subsistence. But the Polo family uh, had a different idea. And that is, well, let's just explore the world and try to bring uh, the products, the commodities, the works of other cultures, of other societies that are completely unknown to us, bring it to Europe and present it to the Europeans and find out what the Europeans will like. And we can establish some form of commercial relations, of course, with those outside merchants and begin to actually import those products. Again, this was really kind of like the seed idea of what today we call just import export you know, type of uh, enterprise. Okay, so it was a long journey. They're going to actually, again, travel all of the old world, leaving Europe, across the Mediterranean, present-day Egypt. Uh, they're going to be moving into across the Middle East. And they're going to cross the Tibetan uh, uh, desert, uh, go into China, spend a number of years in China, learn about Chinese culture and Chinese society. And of course, the Polo, uh, Marco Polo was marveled about the cultural accomplishments and achievements of, uh, of the Chinese in terms of their science, in terms of their architecture. Uh, their social organization, their writing systems, again, they're highly organized. Um, but particularly that gold was abundant okay, in China. It was abundant. This, this is, again, a, a metal, a precious metal that was uh, very abundant in, in, in China. And, and he was uh, so amazed that, you know, he kind of fantasized or romanticized the abundance of the uh, Chinese uh, monarchs, you know, the rulers again, and in that they, it's just a fantasy, of course, of his in his mind, and that he believed China to be so rich that this was going to be the land that will make Europe, or in this case, you know, the city of Venice, uh, prosper as well. If only trading networks, trading links, commercial exchange can be established with the Chinese, then Europeans will have access to the markets uh, of China, like the silks, for example. And he was very interested about the silks. But also, he's going to come across other commodities, of course, things like tea and spices and so on and so forth that he was marbled by. And again, the Chinese producer produced that in massive quantities. Because the Chinese were pretty much, uh, you know, in uh, agreements with uh, the societies around China in Southeast Asia or in India. And there were already commercial networks that had existed for not only hundreds of years, but even thousands of years in which uh, the Chinese had been exporting. It was a commercial empire, by the way. And the Chinese had been pretty much exporting for exports. For a long long time in that they will export products to their neighbors again in southeast asia and also to india so there were strong commercial links here in asia in which china played a key role again in the export of commodities by the way and so of course marco polo found that out and of course what he's imagining is that well maybe europe needs to be participating in this europe needs to be also uh, partnering up with the Chinese, with the merchants also of India that he visited on his way back uh, to Europe. He spent also considerable time in India where he actually picked up uh, a load of spices. He was marbled by the spices produced in India. And he really believed that he had tapped into a commodity that could initiate, again, an international you know, relation between the city of Venice and perhaps other European cities with Asia. And of course, that was spices, by the way. So when he returns in 1295, he's going to bring with him uh, precious goods from the Far East that are going to 
kindle the interest of the Europeans for those products that were in many cases unknown uh, to the Europeans with the only exception of gold and silks. Of course, Europeans were already very much aware of silks and gold. They have been, of course, trading it in the past, but it was so minimal. Again, it was so, uh, the, the rate of exchange was just so minimum that we cannot really consider that as to be a major you know, commercial link between Europe and Asia. You know, the silks, of course. This is something that the nobility uh, will wear. It was a very expensive product. Uh, there's not a, you know, a popular market, in other words, for silks all over Europe that people could actually tap into and, you know, consume. It was just, again, something that the monarchs, the nobility, the royal court uh, could afford. And since the rulers constituted a tiny, tiny fraction of the percentage of the entire percentage of the population. So therefore, I mean, we're not talking about a mass consumer product. But what Marco Polo is suggesting here is that spices could become a mass consumer product. He's really thinking about spices, that this is something that that people will be fascinated by in Europe. The Indian spices, they're very sharp. They can add a lot of aromas and flavor to your dishes. And this is going to, you know, move uh, Europeans to to get this product, you know, to, to make every effort to buy spices. So this is going to become a mass consumer product. That's what he's actually thinking. Because uh, food in Europe was quite bland. You know, this is not something that, you know, people were actually... <laughs> Uh, fascinated by uh, in Europe, you know, food was very bland, very simple. It consisted of, you know, eating bread uh, on a daily basis with cheese, some hams. Uh, people actually preserve hams by rubbing salt or vinegar. And this is how you preserve it. So every time you will eat it, again, you'll have this sour aftertaste and salty aftertaste, of, you know, at the end. And and in the Mediterranean countries, like, you know, the Spanish, Italian uh, towns and settlements uh, of the Mediterranean, people had access, of course, to other things like olive oil, red wine, etc., that pretty much added a little bit more flavor, if you will, uh, uh, certain herbs that people used. But for the most part, when you look at all of Europe, you know, food was not something that kindled uh, the appetite of people, you know, as people were not really called by the food in the kitchen because it was very simplistic. Uh, it was, for the most part, served cold uh, at the same time. So spices were going to alter significantly that pattern because what Marco Polo is saying that this is a product that is going to transform our food culture. We're going to experiment with spices and create a number of dishes that people are going to be fascinated by. Okay, this is going to be something new. And uh, importing those spices is going to actually generate wealth for the merchants engaged in the spice trade. So here it is. This is an import product that is going to change the face of the world. You know, really the international, the first international economy when we talk about mercantilism, for example, okay, we're going to actually describe it very, very thoroughly. Uh, started out with the spice trade. You know, spices is really the key in, uh, commodity, the precious good that is beginning to bind the peoples of the world together commercially, that is to say. Okay, so we still have about 10 more minutes. All right. So... Now, having said that, um, the commercial revolution begins in the 1300s, therefore. Okay, so Marco Polo comes back with the spices and the spice trade begins. And as we move into the 1300s, there's now a commercial revolution taking place in which the Europeans are now sending expeditions. Uh, they're building commercial networks with merchants outside of Europe, particularly in the Mediterranean Ocean, uh, present-day, for example, Greece, around that area, present-day, what is called the region, what today we call 
Egypt, around that area as well. And they're going to develop arrangements uh, by which they're going to now bring large loads of cargoes like spices. They're also interested in bringing, of course, things like teas. Uh, also, they're trading gold and they're also uh, trading silks at the same time. So there's now a commercial revolution, a revolution of commerce. More and more people are finding that in the local market, there is spices, okay, that you can actually buy in Europe, that is to say. So you go to the local market, you're going to start finding items that are imported, okay? Items that are imported, maybe teas of various kinds. There's going to be spices of various kinds as well you can buy. They're all imported, okay? And this is beginning a revolution of commerce beginning in the 1300s. Now, <clears throat> this technological revolution is going to be greatly accelerated with a technological revolution that is beginning to take place in the 13 and 1400s. And this technological revolution is going to start taking place in, in terms of the navigation systems uh, they're going to be improved massively improved in places like portugal the portuguese are very interested in conducting trade but they understand that going inland just simply trying to move cargoes inland for example is very troublesome is very slow you pay a lot of taxes as you move into different kingdoms, of course, and so it's very costly. So they want to accelerate the rate of exchange, the rate of trade. So the Portuguese understand that the best way to do that is to improve their navigation uh, technologies, their vessels, so they can actually navigate in the ocean and travel to to faraway places in order to actually bring more and more cargo, perhaps faster, and avoiding all of those fees and taxes that they have to pay to all the other rulers and lords from other realms. Okay, by the way. All right, so this technological revolution begins roughly in the 1300s as a result of new ideas that are coming from those expeditions when the merchants, the Italian merchants, travel to places like present-day Egypt, for example. There was an Egyptian city. What we call Egypt, for example, uh, today was not necessarily the Egypt of those times. So this is just a convenient term to denote the region, of course, uh, from which today we simply call you know, Egypt. That was the land of the ancient Egyptians, if you will. That land was a very important meeting point uh, of international merchants, merchants that were coming from the Far East, from places like India, for example, there were Chinese merchants as, as well, and also there were uh, Arabian merchants, Turkish merchants, and now Italian merchants arriving. So it was like a hub, if you will, in which there was a meeting, if you will, of different merchants coming from different places. And of course, uh, this trade. Uh, was not just the exchange of goods. When people engage in trade, they're not just exchanging material goods like spices and silks and so on, uh, but there's also another type of exchange. There's two other types of exchange other than exchanging goods. Um, and that is ideas and germs. When, again, merchants are there, they're exchanging ideas, they're exchanging information, uh, books, writings that they bring from their own cultures. They're borrowed, they're copied, they're exchanged. And so when you return to your hometown, to your city, 
let's say you come from the city of Venice, the Italian merchant is going to return not only with spices, but that merchant is going to return also with books, information uh, that was written by other peoples that are going to be used to create change, to create new tools, new technologies uh, in, in Europe, in this case, navigation technologies. But also they bring germs because, again, this is another thing that people exchange. Well, you know, you, you, know, you go to another place, there's bacteria, there's, you know, microbes and so on that you become exposed to. Uh, virus and so on various kinds and of course that is also exchange so when you return back to your city you're coming also with disease as well so those are very important things that we should mention is that whenever there is international trade taking place people are exchanging also uh, they're exchanging of course uh, you know other than goods they're exchanging information in germs so what kind of ideas? Well, the kind of ideas that the Europeans, uh, the Italian merchants coming from, let's say, the Middle East and places like, you know, the Egyptian cities I just mentioned, you know, they're coming back with a lot of writings, certain books that other societies wrote in the past, whether they were written by the ancient Egyptians, whether they were written by the ancient Chinese uh, peoples and so on and so forth and they're going to use them in different combinations to generate this technological revolution in navigation for example they're bringing a lot of information about the position of the stars the star charts you know people who study astronomy in other cultures in other civilizations and wrote their understanding of the moon cycles the, the sun cycles the cycles of the planets, the positions of the constellations of the stars, and so on and so forth, the maps of the sky, that is to say, the maps of the sky. And this is going to be very useful for creating this technological revolution in navigation, particularly by the Portuguese, because the star charts are going to be used to orient navigators the captains of the ships that the portuguese portuguese are in the process of building the large vessels the large cargo ships in that in order to know where you're going in order to find yourself to you know your position in the world uh, it became extremely important to identify the stars so you can actually orient yourself where you're going whether you're going north northeast northwest southwest etc just by looking at the sky. The sky is like a radar that can guide you so you don't feel completely lost once you are in open waters, that is to say, in the middle of the ocean. That can be very frightening. So the stars can guide you, you know, in your journeys when you're beginning to, you know, try to discover and explore the world, of course. So the star charts. Uh, another, of course, uh, type of idea uh, that was brought from those trips uh, in, uh, by the Italian merchants is the magnetic needle. This is a device that was invented by the ancient Chinese. It's a magnetic needle. It's a needle that is magnetized, so it always points north to the North Pole. So this is also going to be used by the navigators to actually orient themselves as to at least know where the North Pole is so you at least know your position again in the ocean. That's another uh, device you know, for uh, it's, it's a kind of like the early origins of the GPS, if you will. Okay, um, The Latin cell, this is yet another uh, you know, innovation. The Latin cell uh, is a kind of uh, square tarp, if you will, that will be added to a central pole in the cargo ship that will be used for uh, propelling the ship forward by the use of wind power. So instead of rowing, it's, people are still continuing to row, of course, on both sides, that uh, if you add the Latin sail, this is another piece of innovation that was brought to life during the 13 and 1400s by the Portuguese is that you use wind power 
if you want your ship to move forward as fast as possible instead of rowing you just add the latin sail you control it in any way you want depending on which direction the wind is blowing of course and you can use the wind to your advantage to move the ship forward another very 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 important innovation and of course uh, what this is going to do is that the portuguese particularly are going to use those ideas those tools those technologies those innovations whether we're talking about the star charts the magnetic needle for example the latin cell um, and they're going to use them to start now building larger and larger vessels what we call today a merchant fleet okay uh, their idea is we want to get to the far east uh, we want to find a route to india and brings more and more spices as as much as we can of course uh, we want to save ourselves a lot of monies you know paying tributes and fees along the way uh, in conflict of course we want to avoid all conflicts uh, we we want to avoid the middleman you know because when you deal with a middleman you know there's always a higher price that you can pay you want to deal with the producer directly to buy wholesale in other words you know the spice trade the spice trade was extremely profitable uh during those times in the 1300s in this commercial revolution that uh, the europeans really wanted to accelerate some form of transportation technology they want to accelerate the development of this transportation technology uh, as quickly as possible in order to accelerate the rate of trade so once again what is really changing the world is trade because that is not just connecting people together and they're exchanging material goods they're exchanging ideas information that is going to transform technologies like transportation systems that will allow people to travel faster uh, around the world in order to accelerate that trade of course so of course another you know technologies that came with this again uh, technological revolution is again the gunpowder this is something invented by the chinese the chinese have been using that for centuries the gunpowder for fireworks for their festivals and the gunpowder is going to be reworked the use of the gunpowder to develop things like for example cannons in 1320s and muskets and many of those cannons will be simply added to the ships in many cases by the portuguese to defend themselves in many cases from pirates um and also the invention of the musket in 1499 which of course are going to be used by of course soldiers uh, portuguese soldiers are going to be also traveling along those trade routes and explorations by the portuguese and they're going to be opening up more and more trade as they're moving forward in their exploration so the portuguese are going to be the pioneers of this age of discovery and exploration uh, again it's initiated by marco polo he's the father of this commercial revolution with his famous expedition to the far east when he after three decades or so comes back with a lot of products exotic uh, products precious goods like spices silks uh, teas and gold and he's going to really open up uh, Europe to the Far East commercially and this interest of spices is going to push Europeans you know to demand more and more the spices and now they're being brought uh, by the Italian merchants Italian merchants who at the same time bring new ideas new technologies from other places and they're putting those ideas and technologies to use to build the large fleets and they're beginning to the Portuguese that is to say to use those fleets to explore bodies of water uh, particularly in West Africa you know they're really interested in pretty much exploring all of the bodies of water and gaining knowledge about you know the continent of Africa uh, because they're interested in opening up a trade route to India around Africa they're very interested and all of this knowledge is now offered 
uh, in schools of navigation. Portugal is going to develop the first schools of navigation in Europe, and they're going to become the master's navigators. In other words, the best universities, and perhaps even the only ones that existed during this time are for navigators. If you're going to become a captain, a navigator of a ship, and so on, or just to know how to navigate, you will go to Portugal, and you'll study under those schools uh, and earn a degree before you actually, you know, begin to explore the world around you uh, in bodies of water. Christopher Columbus was a graduate, by the way, of those schools of navigation. And the idea, again, is that you want to train navigators that will be sent into those expeditions around uh, Africa. Again, the idea is you want to reach India, okay? So this is Portugal right here. What you want is to explore bodies of water here around the west coast of Africa, gain significant knowledge of how the wind and the currents move, the, the um, underneath sea currents, if you will, in order to find a trade route to the spices. Again, this is, again, what they attempted to do. And the idea is that the Portuguese were trying to navigate around the continent of Africa to directly move into India and bring the spices back, uh, uh, directly back to Portugal and avoid all of the hassle of trying to go through all of this process of uh, navigating through the Mediterranean Sea or going inland and so on, all of the hassles I just explained. So again, this is a technological revolution that initiates in the 1300s, but it's really in the 1400s, particularly in the 1400s, that the Portuguese, beginning in the 1430s, are really trying to push the boundary, the frontier of their African uh, ex explorations uh, further and further every year, every decade. Again, they have a goal, and the goal is we need to reach the Far East. We need to reach India as quickly as possible. Okay, so with that, we conclude our, um, yeah, so we conclude our uh, lecture on the, um, the first session on the European discovery, conquest, and colonization of America. So when we come back, uh, in session two, uh, we're going to now look at the rise of mercantilism, this international economic system, look at the features of that, and then move into the actual discovery of America and the conquest. So more than likely, session two is going to discuss the rise of mercantilism, the discovery of America, and, uh, and the conquest of the Aztecs in this case. Okay, so this is the end of session one. If you have any questions, please let me know and I will answer them as quickly as I can. Thank you. Goodbye.